1914. For the second time in less than half a century, the young American Republic is at war with England. The frontier is aflame with a thousand bloody skirmishes whose names have long been lost in the stream of history. Yet out of this Holocaust grew the men who were to mold the future of America. Among them, the Indian fighter who has already begun to build a legend which will make him the seventh president of the United States, Andrew Jackson. Who is that young idiot? <laughs> platoon. Kind of lost track of them as we come over the hill, sir. And that was apparent. I require my officers to lead their men, Lieutenant, not to try to win my battle single-handed. Yes, sir. Man could get himself killed that way. Man can also win battles that way, General. Where did you learn to speak such good English? From him. I was brought up with the Cherokees, sir. You were brought up with the Cherokees? Yes, sir. Lieutenant, when you get on your feet again, you come and see me. I just might have some use for a man who understands Indians. Yeah, I told you you'd be some good to me someday. This nation will hail him forever as the Avenger of the Alamo. But he was destined to burn his name into the legends of this land long before he ever saw the great plains of Texas. His name? Sam Houston. three years and two months, when a strange delegation appeared at the offices of the United States Secretary of War. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to present Mr. Metcalf, who's here on behalf of the Appropriations Committee. What is the meaning of this? Well, the meaning, Mr. Secretary, is that you kept the chief of the Cherokees waiting in your office for three hours, while you sat in here and talked to every ragtag and bobtailed merchant and swindling the city of Washington. Get that man out of here. I would like very much, sir, to know your name. You might try Lieutenant Sam Houston, Cal. General Jackson, sir. Lieutenant. This is the man you appointed as Indian representative? In the flesh. And if I was you, Cal, I'd see those Cherokees. Because if they get mad enough to walk out of here, you're going to have a full-scale war on your hands. All right, Lieutenant. Send them in. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, may I present my foster father, Uluteka, Chief of the Cherokees. You are welcome. My blood brother, Tuchila. The Chief returns your greetings. You have our land. 
We want to know why the government now refuses to pay the Cherokees the money that is coming to us. You may tell the chief that every effort has been made to expedite payment. Every effort? There's got to be an end, Mr. Secretary, to this political double talk. They're sick and tired of efforts. They want action. Lieutenant, sooner or later the government has got to realize these men are being cheated. When I want the benefit of your advice, Lieutenant, I'll ask for it. Gentlemen, I assure you again that everything possible is being done. And if you would care to follow me, I'm sure President Monroe would like to meet you and to add his assurances to my own. I think we can do nicely without your presence, Lieutenant. The President, Mr. Houston, is used to seeing his officers in uniform. <laughs> It's a Cherokee ceremonial dress. I wear it because I'm their representative. Think I'm a fool? I thought Cherokee ceremonial was before you were born. I'm sorry. Stop apologizing. Never apologize, never retreat, never lose your temper. First three rules of diplomacy. What are you grinning at? Well, with all respect, sir, you uh, have a reputation for the worst temper in the United States Army. <laughs> Poppycock. Poppycock. I'm the mildest mannered man that ever lived. Well, boy, what do you think you're going to do now? Sir? I said, what do you think you're going to do now? You certainly don't expect to have a commission when you leave this building, do you? Why, you think I never saw a Secretary of War yet know anything about fighting, but they're all real ripped snorters when it comes to protocol. And they don't take kindly to being dressed down by lieutenants. All I did was tell them the truth. He's the Secretary of War, isn't he? The Indians are his responsibility. What does it take to make these people understand? A little more unrighteous indignation, which seems to be all you brought with you. Wonder if I was ever really young enough to believe that all that was necessary to redress evil was to discover the truth, and then present it to the authorities. Uh, what else is there? Well, for one thing, there's diplomacy, context and prestige, some knowledge of the mechanics of politics. Mostly, boy, there's a thing called power. Power is the fuel that runs governments as well as armies. Without a measure of power, all the truth and all the indignation in the world won't get you for. Yeah. How do you go about acquiring power? Some men buy it. Some are born to it. And some work for it. How? Calhoun started out studying law. So did I. There may be other routes to power, but during peacetime, law is the shortest one I know of. Do you know a good man to read under? I think your old friend, Judge Trimble, good as anyone I can think of. Well, the judge doesn't know it yet, but he just got himself a pupil. Sam, to your new career. That's a... Uh, Let's hope it doesn't end as abruptly as your last one. In five years, with Jackson's help, the spectacular young firebrand from Tennessee went from small town lawyer to attorney general of Nashville County, and then on to two triumphant terms in the Congress of the United States. It's my firm belief that if I am reelected to the Congress of the United States to serve the glorious and sovereign state of Tennessee, that we can have a firmer, a surer voice in the decisions that affect each and every one of you here today. Yeah. Taxation is not the only problem you've discussed with me. The plight of the small farmer must be faced now, not six months from now, now! Yeah. You know, some serious thought isn't given to the problem of Indian grievances. The West is going to see the worst bloodbath that's ever known. Houston, why don't you forget about the Indians? They're a lost cause. Would you excuse me again, An Uninformed please, opinion, moment. Mr. Stanberry, is worse than no opinion at all. Eliza, excuse us, Chester Ball. Excuse me. 
Eliza, dear, I'm sorry to take you away from your friends, but... Well, I'm afraid if something isn't done over there, we're, we're going to have a scene. Oh, Mother, please. Now, Eliza, you're used to handling Mr. Houston very easily, dear, and, and it'll just take just a moment. Please. A moment? If I go over there, he'll spend the rest of the evening talking to me about, about some place called Texas or, or the rights of the Indians. Eliza. We're moving west too fast to concern ourselves with the fate of a few oh, dirty right. savages. Savages? Those savages, Stanway, have more honor and decency than some congressman I could mention. You are referring to me, sir. And if I am... Mr. Houston. Miss Hallam? I'm ashamed of you, sir. Ashamed? I'm being most dreadfully neglected. As are all the other young ladies at this party. We absolutely forbid all of you to say another word about politics tonight. Uh, may I have the honor, Miss Hallam? Thank you, Mr. Houston. Now, gentlemen, you will please circulate. One of these days, someone's going to pull him down off his high horse. Well, just so it isn't me. <laughs> He's already nearly killed one man in a duel. Hello, Daddy. Hello, dear. Mr. Houston, the governor would like to see you. Well, your daughter and I would just... My daughter will be here all evening, Mr. Houston. Well, in that case, ladies, if you'll excuse me. Eliza, has it ever occurred to you that Mr. Houston has more than a casual interest in you? Oh, evening, Sam. General. Good evening. I didn't expect to see you here. Governor? Mr. Houston. Sam, uh, Governor Carroll's got a proposition he wants to make to you, and for some reason he wants to have me here while he makes it. Proposition, sir? Well, let us say, uh, an offer. How would you like to be governor of Tennessee? The governorship? Uh, uh, let me see here. You've been governor three terms. You don't want to quit, but the Constitution won't let you run again, correct? Correct. Well, then what you're looking for is not so much a governor as somebody to keep your seat warm for two years till you're eligible to run again. <laughs> what do you think, General? Oh, I think it's your cake, Sam. You cut it the way you want it. Before you make a decision, Houston, let's take a look at all the cards. The General here is going into the White House. Maybe. Well, you were the only one who has any doubt about it. That will leave a Senate seat vacant. A seat which will be a lot easier to win if you just stepped out of the governor's chair. You want my answer now? Right now. All right, I'll run. And you'll step down after one term? I'll remember your wishes, Governor. But political climates have a way of changing unexpectedly. I wouldn't want to make any promises I wasn't sure I could keep. But I could break you, Houston. <laughs> you could try, Governor. I don't think you will. Uh, stakes are awfully high. If you lose, you'll be finished as a political power in the state. I told you he was learning. You win, Mr. Houston. I think I could beat you with any one of a half a dozen candidates. But as you say, I can't afford the risk. <laughs> well, then, we agreed. Agreed. Now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I'm keeping a young lady waiting. Good night, Governor. Good night, Sam. Good night, sir. It's rather warm tonight, you think? Only for governors, William. Only for governors. that as governor, I will serve this state with honor and with diligence. And now, I would like you to meet one of the loveliest young women in the state of Tennessee. It gives me great honor to announce that she has consented to become my wife, Miss Eliza Allen.
Colana, I bring you wishes from the nation of Cherokees. Thank you. My dear, I want you to meet my family. Uru Teka, chief of the Cherokees. Tutsila, my blood brother. When we were young, we cut our wrists and pressed them together so our blood would mingle. The chief called my husband Korlene. What does that mean, Colonel? No, it means the raven. In our legends, the raven is the cleverest and most fortunate of all creatures. We believe he is descended from the gods. It's the name the chief gave me when I became his adopted son. Sam! One that seems to have been prophetic. Congratulations. And Thank you, Mr. President. Eliza, I wish you every happiness. You know, Sam is quite a catch. Chief, what do you think of your boy now? Governor, 35. <laughs> He'll be after my job next. So long as he doesn't hang on to mine. <laughs> I hate to disturb this happy group, but the bridal carriage is waiting. I'm off to Washington. Maybe sometime before I see you again, I'm going to tell you. I'm proud of you. Mr. President, I could never have done it without your help. Oh, I've helped others, boy. Sometimes I've been rewarded with arrogance, stupidity, and even treachery. Now that I'm president, some of the men I put in office are out to get me. You watch it, boy. They know you're my friend. They may try to get you, too. Let them try. That's the spirit. Never retreat, never apologize, and never lose your temper. <laughs> I remember. I was still having a little trouble with the last one. Goodbye, sir, and thank you. God bless you all. Sam Houston was at home in any kind of company. He loved crowds, he loved excitement. And in the months that followed his election as governor, he kept a schedule of public appearances that would have killed most ordinary men. corn and barbecued beef and to the glorious and sovereign state of Tennessee. <laughs> Any man that can't drain his cup to that toast is not a true son of Tennessee. <laughs> oh, oh, hold your horse. Hey, somebody I want you to meet. I don't want to go, please. Oh, come on, honey. They want to meet you. The prettiest girl ever to grace the governor's mansion. My wife, Eliza. If I've been a good governor, it's all because of her. As a matter of fact, she's made my job so easy. I've decided to run for second term. Hey, Sam, what about Billy Carroll? Who's Billy Carroll? <laughs> <laughs> With this little lady beside me, I can lick all the Billy Carrolls in the world. Sam Houston for president! Yeah! Yeah! Well, honey, you heard him with your own ears. There'll never be a doubt about it, not after the night. They're behind us every inch of the way. All I know all I talk about the presidency is just so much high spirits. Maybe after another term in the governor's mansion, there might not be uh, too much to think about. The president would be tickled to death, wouldn't he? Loved you since you were a little girl. He's like having his own daughter in the White House. 
We'll have a fight on our hands from Billy Carroll. There's no question about it. He wants the governorship back. But I don't think he can take it. I think we can lick him, honey. I don't think it. I know it. Billy's lost the touch. The first rule I learned at Andy Jackson's knee. Never lose the common touch. Get out with the people. Let them know you're one of them. In a year and a half, we've been in the governor's mansion. Billy hasn't made more than a half a dozen speeches. You and I have been all over this countryside, time after time. Now, honey, what we can do in Tennessee, we can do in every state of the union. Oh, I know what you're thinking about. I realize that it's a little uh, terrifying to be brought up against the reality of becoming the first lady of the land. But, honey, you're more of a woman at 19 than any hostess in the capital. Liza, I'm a lucky man. I don't love you, Sam. If you had looked at me, if you had looked at me just once in all these weeks, you would have known. They made me. They told me that you were all any girl could ask for in a man. They wanted their daughter in the governor's mansion. And they made me feel that if I refused, everything they'd ever done for me was wasted. Sam, please, try to understand. I didn't mean to hurt you. I tell you before, I even thought of leaving, but, but I, I didn't want to cause a scandal. I didn't want to do anything to hurt your career. Sam. Sam, I'll stay with you. I promise you, I'll stay with you. Get out of here. Get out of this house. Now. During the next five days, Ex-Governor Carroll's rabble-rousers had a field day at Houston's expense. Do we want a man like this as governor of Tennessee? No! no. Do we want someone in the governor's mansion who has no love and respect for the woman he married? No! I say to you that Eliza Allen is the daughter of one of the finest families in Tennessee. She came to Sam Houston in love and innocence, willing to join her life with his. And what did he do? He drove her into the street without a word of explanation. I say impeach him. Yeah, impeach him. Yeah, impeach him. This man is not even a true son of Tennessee. He was born in Virginia. Why didn't you fight? Let's get him out of this mansion. Out of the state and impossible all the way out of this union. Why didn't you fight? How, oh, Billy? We don't want no social... Cut her to pieces just to save my neck. We don't want no Virginia You got to tell the truth to do that, you know. <sighs> she never loved me. She married me under false pretenses. I didn't know. You know now. Well, don't fret about it, Billy. This here is politics, you know. Dog eat dog and the devil take the hindmost. Well, what do you expect from me? Love and kisses? What do you want from me, absolution? No, sir. That what brings you around the back door? You're a little late, Billy. Listen. 
I got a buggy around the back. <laughs> you don't mind destroying a man's reputation and his honor, but you don't want to see anybody get hurt. Is that it? Well, that's, that's nice. I wonder what really is going on inside that devious old noodle of yours. Are you afraid of Jackson when he finds out what you've done? Sam, you have to believe me. I never dreamed it'd go this far. Well, that's the way of it, Billy. When you go digging around in a garbage heap, you never know what you're likely to come up with. Where are you going? My constituents are calling for me. They'll kill you. Just for the record, Billy, it was all for nothing. Unnecessary. I never would have run again without her. A resignation is there on the table. of the few friends which remained to him, Sam Houston disappeared. For months, he wandered, apparently without purpose or direction. But in late summer, he reached the goal he had not even known he was seeking. The raven had come home. What is it? Shaking sickness, he's very bad. White man cannot treat my red brothers like dogs. Bury the hatchet of war. Nice. You've heard what he is telling the young men? I have heard. How long will you hold back your hand? When we could not get the money the white man promised for our lands, he got it for us. When they gave us tainted meat, which killed many of our children, he made them listen to our protest. He saved my life. He is my blood brother. But he has a sickness in him which infects the young men of the tribe. They do not work in the fields. They do not listen to the elders. They have ears only for his wild dreams of this place he calls Texas. He will get well. But when? Our demands must be met now. The winter is coming. Unless the white man can be made to keep his word, our people will starve. He will be well before the snows. He will go see the great white chief. He'll give us back our pride as he gave it once before. My father, you are a great chief, but love has dimmed your vision. The raven will not help us. You will go. You will try to see Chief Jackson. My horse. I will go. To Sheila. Where are you going? To Washington. What for? To do the work you should be doing? 
I told you I was never going back there. Why? Because it is too painful for you? Because the memory of the woman has made life too empty? Yes, I told you that. You told me a lot of things, and I listened because you were sick and I was your brother, and I said nothing. Now let there be truth between us. I tell you that it is not the loss of the woman that has brought you here. No. What then? You are here because it is more important to you to be loved than to do great things. Uh, there was fire in your blood when the raven was on the wing, when his name was on everyone's lips. Yeah, but now you find that cheers are not love, that the world can hate too, that it can be vicious and dangerous, that part of the price a man must pay for greatness is the hatred of little men. And so the mighty raven, who shone almost as brightly as Jackson himself, has buried his fire in a bottle and has run away from the chirping of sparrows. And more, he does not even have the courage to run alone. He wants us, the whole nation of Cherokees, to run with him, because that way he can still pretend he is a glorious leader. Get out of that horse. I'm gonna kill you. There's not enough man left in you. Tell my father goodbye. Tuchila's gone? He is gone. His words last night. My brother is a man. I will send him back to you. And Texas? There will be time enough for Texas when my father's people are fed. Sam, I'm asking you once again to keep out of this. Sir, there's nothing in this world I'd hate more than to embarrass you again. But I don't have any choice. The devil was your embarrassment. I'm fighting for my life. Those jackals after my blood and you... All you do is to come here and talk to me about the rights of Indians. No, sir. I didn't come here to whine about rights. Not anymore. I've grown up that much. I'm talking about survival, sir. If the Cherokees don't get the food we promised them, they won't last the winter. Now, you listen to me, Sam, and you listen hard. Nobody is more concerned about the plight of the Indians than I am. But get it through your head. I can't help them. Not I won't help them. I can't. With Stan Berry and his crowd in charge of Indian appropriations, my hands are tied. Stan Berry. <laughs> Everywhere I turn, that crooked gerrymandering old son. Oh, yes, he's all of that, but you stay away from him. You hear me? Because you give him only half a chance, he'll not only smash you, he'll use your presence here in Washington as a weapon against this office. Well, sir, you have my full permission to disown me. Your permission? Why, you arrogant I mean young... Mr. President. The last time I backed off from a fight, it cost me all I had. And all in the world 
had accomplished was to hurt the people that had been kindest to me. Including yourself, sir. Sam. Sam, Billy Carroll nearly finished you. And he was just an amateur compared to Stanbury. Billy Carroll won because I let him win. Good morning, Mr. President. Is it your intention to re-enter public life, Mr. Houston? Yes, it is. Is that what you talked to the president about? No. We talked about the fact that uh, a few dishonest and disreputable congressmen are making monstrous and illegal profit off the monies the federal government has allocated for Indian rations. I don't suppose you'd be willing to name any names. Why not? The man I'm after is the man who's opposed every responsible piece of Indian legislation since he came to Congress. Representative Stanbury of Ohio. I tell you that this man who resigned the governorship in the teeth of a notorious scandal and who fled like a common thief to take refuge with savages is a liar. <laughs> this barbarian, this betrayer of women, this half-savage who came to the national capital in Indian rags has accused us publicly of the crime of which he himself is guilty. It was pretty strong stuff, Will, and this Houston's a hothead. Aren't you worried about what he'll do when he reads it? come when the Indian will cease to be a curiosity. Why should it? The white man continues to be a curiosity to the Indian. Stay away from me, Houston. I sent you a note two days ago, Mr. Stanbury. The note demanded satisfaction from you, a public apology. I haven't had a reply. I don't fight duels, Houston. And I don't apologize to Indian lovers. Now, Mr. Stanbury, I'm going to whip you within an inch of your life. <laughs> and I demand that this house take official action. I demand that this criminal, this attempted assassin, be arrested and punished. I deny the charge of assassin. I deny that I intended to do great bodily harm. I deny that I attempted to commit contempt of this house. Then you wish to enter a plea of not guilty? I enter no plea whatsoever. I protest that this matter is not within the jurisdiction of the Congress of the United States. The members have already decided that it is, Mr. Houston. You will have 48 hours to prepare your defense. Fools. The blind fools making a kangaroo court out of the House of Representatives. And you, you did the very thing I warned you not to do, picking a brawl in the public streets, giving Stanbury all the ammunition he needed to scuttle us both. Why? That's a dandy question from a man that's fought 97 duels. <laughs> I don't know. I just do not know how you do it. Any other man would have got himself thrown in jail as a public nuisance, but you, you end up as a national spectacle. First man in the history of this country to be publicly tried by the Congress of the United States. Well, I got the audience I went after. Oh, yes, you got an audience, all right. You got the whole United States of America waiting to see you get your ears pinned back. Sam, don't you have any idea, any idea at all of the trouble you're in? Has it never even occurred to you what will happen if you lose? They'll put me in jail for a while. Jail? 
before Stanberry is through with you. He'll see to it that everybody in this city believes that your attack on him was an attack on congressional immunity and therefore an attack on every single member of the House of Representatives. Win or lose, he'll see to it that you come out of this branded as a vicious and dangerous malcontent. Don't you understand? I'm sorry, I... I wish there was something I could do to help you. Yeah. Get yourself some decent clothes. Neither one of us has ever been quite civilized, but there's no point in advertising it. Sam Houston lasted for 10 weeks. But for the first time, his brilliant legal maneuvers, his superb sense of logic, seemed to be falling on deaf ears. On the final day, the press had already convicted him on paper, and the audience was still hostile. I have here a pistol which belongs to you, sir. You dropped it when you ran away. Gentlemen, I protest this. When you ran away, sir. But not before you had placed this pistol at my chest and pulled the trigger like this, which fortunately misfired. I've been unable to produce this evidence until now because I couldn't prove that these pistols belonged to Mr. Stanbury, but I now have that proof. This is an affidavit from the gunsmith who sold this brace of pistols to Mr. Stanbury on the very day that he denounced me in these chambers. Now I ask, gentlemen, who was the attempted assassin? Sam Houston, who carried nothing but a light cane? Or Mr. Stanbury, who attempted to kill me but failed? Gentlemen, I protest this vehemently. I'm not on trial here. But you are, sir. And not only you, but this house, this government, this very nation is on trial. If a handful of men with dishonest motives can use these proceedings as a smokescreen for their nefarious activities, then I say it is not my rights which are in jeopardy here, but the rights of every citizen of this nation. <laughs> However, I did not come here, gentlemen, to defend constitutional privilege, but to awaken this government to the knowledge of a terrible crime, which with the connivance of these men has been perpetrated on the Indian, a crime which brings dishonor on every one of us. You're a fine one to talk about honor. The congressman from Ohio will be silent, please. Mr. Stanbury has got himself a point for once. Let me acknowledge that I am not the perfect man even to plead the rights of those who are helpless to plead them for themselves. And let me admit that I come before you in fear. Not for what your judgment may do to me, but for what it may do to a great and honorable man whom I am proud to call a friend, the President, Mr. Jackson. I'm well aware that whatever is decided here in like manner reflects not only upon me, but upon him. That is the way Mr. Stanbury and his friends have planned it. However, I am here, gentlemen, and I do plead, not for myself, but for justice, to those whom I represent. I ask you, as men of honor, to search your souls, to ask yourselves, in the deepest recesses of your conscience, 
if you wish this man to be deprived of that which we, in honor and in justice, promised to him, in return for that which was his God-given birthright. I tell you, gentlemen, that not one-tenth of the goods and monies which we promised have ever reached this man's people. Why? Because Mr. Stanbury and his friends have stolen it and used it to fatten their own bank accounts. And I can prove that statement. I can prove that statement. But not from a prison cell. And not from the bottom of a hangman's noose, which is where Mr. Stanbury is desperately trying to put me. If you allow him to do it, if you permit the great and glorious power of this legislative body to be used as a cloak for Stanbury's sordid machinations, you will subvert the principles upon which this government and this nation were founded and by which, with the help of God, they shall long endure. Sam, that was quite a speech. Thank you, sir. You got to all now, boy, when those papers hit the streets, you'll be the most popular man in the country. Mm, till I make my next mistake. You keep surprising me, boy. That's one thing I figured you'd never learn. I believe I can make a place in my cabinet for a bright young man who doesn't know when he's licked. Thank you, sir. But I have other plans. Ah, Texas. It's a whole new country out there, Mr. President. Goodbye, Sam. Goodbye, sir. Sam. Yes, sir. You've come a long, long way. Thank you, sir. Sam Houston was to go a great deal further. He was not yet 40 years of age when he walked out of the nation's capital and into a legend. Ahead of him lay even more glorious victories. He was to be commander-in-chief of an army, destroyer of Santa Ana, Avenger of the Alamo, President of a Republic, and finally, the man who brought the mighty territory of Texas into the Union. Truly, he was a giant. Before previewing next week's great adventure, here is Gerald Goff, a teacher and member of the National Education Association, with a postscript on tonight's story. From the War of 1812 to the great victory at San Jacinto to the Civil War, Sam Houston indeed cut a dramatic swath across the mosaic of American history. In tonight's story alone, we saw a man accomplish more than most people do in a lifetime. He was a man who fought hard for his friends and even harder against his enemies. His staunch loyalty to his blood brothers, the Cherokees, was equaled only by his fierce adherence to the Union. Later, he would defend that precious union with words that have a special meaning today. I make no distinction between Southern rights and Northern rights. Our rights are common to the whole union. I am for the union without any ifs. And my motto, it shall be preserved. Here are a few scenes from our next episode of The Great Adventure. I always pay a railroad to take my rations to San Francisco. But what is this? When the prices go up, the rates, they go up, but too. You put your hand in my pocket, you steal my money. You know better than that, Petrosian. The railroad's not in business for its help. Oh, right, how many horses we lose, huh? I counted them, Pop. Two horses got away. How far you think we're gonna get? 
We already lost two wagons. We ain't even started yet. Maybe we lose three more wagons, huh? Maybe we only get to San Francisco with one wagon. Maybe we only got one box of raisins to sell. But we do it together. Get out of the way! You're on railroad property. Can't you read? Read? <laughs> 